thanks for being here uh, for our last session here. Um, so I just want to give a little a little setup of, of what this is. Um, this is a paper that I've actually presented last year at two conferences, uh, the 16th Century Studies Conference and the Evangelical Theological Society. Um, and initially, how I got on the topic was I was invited to do a book review uh, for Church History, the journal entitled Church History on Calvin and the Reformed Tradition. And I was teaching our Doctrine Two class here at Kuiper and getting the topic of limited atonement. And the two really intersected, and I've done my uh, doctoral research on this guy named John Acklampadius that you'll hear a little bit more about. Uh, and I thought, oh, I wonder what his view on this was. Um, and so then I was invited to participate in 16th century studies in a Luther, Lutheran and Reformed uh, panel. And so I was like, oh, well, then I need to pull in somebody else. So that's how Philip Melanchthon got in here as well. Um, and so you'll hear more about him as well. Uh, so part of what I'll do is be reading this, part of it I'll be commenting on it, and I've provided some pictures up here uh, as well so you can see and on your handout also you've got pictures of these guys and what they uh, looked like back in the 16th century. Alright, so um, one of the, the most controversial uh, topics in Reformed theology is this teaching really unfortunately labeled limited atonement. Um, this is the L in Tulip. Right? So this is not an introduction to TULA, uh, the, the five, uh, the acronym there that's used to describe these five points of Calvinism, um, but this is really digging deeper into one of these and expanding it out historically. Um, so this is actually the five points that come out of the Synod of Dort, 1618 to 1619, after Calvin has already been dead. So it really is kind of mislabeled, um, the five points of Calvinism. The question for limited atonement is usually asked this way. Did Christ's death pay for the sins of all people or only for the elect? And I'm going to expand our question and address limited atonement and expand limited atonement um, because that's not actually the most helpful way uh, or the way that people in the Reformation era actually address this kind of question. All right, so and as I engage with this book uh, by Richard Muller, he said, um, this, you know, this is usually in the Calvinist versus Arminian debate, um, but he insists, and I would say rightly so, we need richer and more sophisticated understandings of the history of this doctrine, which can only be, further, can only be obtained by further study, and this is what he's calling us to do, the exegesis of all the biblical passages in question in all the exegetical works of Calvin's contemporaries and of writers in the later Reformed tradition. <laughs> I'm going to do two of them, a little piece of this. Um, I can't do all of them. Uh, so many, many scholars have actually noted that Calvin's own view is debated, um, whether or not, because this is debates that, that actually take place later than Calvin. Um, so it's, there's a debate whether or not Calvin actually held to what is classically called uh, limited atonement. Um, I'm, my purpose here is not to really look at Calvin's, but actually move before Calvin uh, and widen the lens as, as Richard Muller suggests. All right, so we're going to look at these two uh, near contemporaries, contemporaries of, uh, of John Calvin. Philip Melanchthon, there on the left, and Johannes, or sometimes John, Aquilampadius. And you've got your, their, their dates there. Um, already as early as 1519, so if you're familiar with your Reformation history, uh, 1517 was when Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door and kind of sparked the Reformation. So already as early as 1519, Johannes Aquilampadius is expressing similar ideas um, about the evangelical, the term that they use there, evangelical faith in contrast to the Roman Catholic faith. He was ordained as a Roman Catholic priest. Um, he was a, a professor at Basel, the University of Basel, and a pastor in Basel, what's now Switzerland, um, is, was very instrumental in the early, uh, the early Reformation and uh, the growth of the reformed movement associated with Zwingli. Um, it's a little bit different stream than what we have with Calvin and Beza and later in, in, the, in Geneva. Um, and so he's at the same time as Martin Luther. All right? um, Philip Melanchthon is the, the most well-known colleague of uh, Martin Luther. So he's, a, he's a, a Lutheran, a typical Lutheran, and he has quite an influence on Lutheranism. Um, as you can see from their birth dates, Aquilampadius is 15 years older than Philip Melanchthon. But they both went to Tubingen at the same time in 1512. And they met there, 
and had a profound impact on each other's lives. Um, and actually in the forthcoming uh, Westminster Theological Journal, I have an article in there about the intersection of Philip Melanchthon and Johannes Aquapadius and the life that they uh, lived together and the breakdown of their uh, friendship, particularly over debates over the Lord's Supper. Um, but it establishes their, their growth, their collegiality, their love for one another. Um, Melanchthon, uh, 20 years after Aquapadius had died, said that Aquapadius was like a father to him. Um, and so these, these two had a profound impact on one another's uh, lives and uh, contributions to the Reformation. All right, so that's a, a brief introduction to them. Uh, they not only disagreed on the Lord's Supper, they also disagreed on the extent of Christ's death. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at here. And before I dig into what they did, I want to give some terminology, uh, which is also in your handout there. Uh, often this is broken down as limited atonement or unlimited atonement. Uh, unlimited atonement can also, you'll run across this, uh, be referred to as general redemption or universal atonement. And so actually when I'm calling, uh, when I'm referring to Melanchthon's view, I'll more often use the universal atonement language. All right? Limited atonement is better described as particular redemption, or a lot of times people will use the term definite atonement, um, because limited sounds limiting. Uh, it's not as, as helpful. A third category that you're going to need to be aware of, uh, that I, uh, as I engage in this, discovered we need to expand our lens, uh, is hypothetical universalism. Right? That's also kind of a problematic term, because when we hear universalism, we think the idea that everybody's going to be saved. It's not, it's a universal atonement. So it's hypothetical, this is the if part, the atonement would be universal, like number one, if everyone had believed. But it's not universal, it's only hypothetically so. All right, and I'll explain a little bit more of that uh, in the taxonomy that you have there as well. So the criteria that we have to use when investigating uh, what specific exegetes said on these relevant biblical passages uh, is not enough to simply find them saying Christ's death paid for the sins of the whole world. That we might draw the conclusion, oh, well then they, they agree with you know, unlimited atonement, universal uh, atonement. Or, it's not enough to find that Christ's death paid for the sins of the elect. And then conclude, oh, well they must believe limited atonement, or definite atonement, depending on which way you want to refer to it. Uh, the scriptures say those kind of things. Um, and so these, actually, almost everyone would agree no matter what their position, would agree with each of these statements. The question is how they correspond and how you explain what the, the grounds or the intention of God in deciding what, this, what Christ's death was going to accomplish. Um, so as we look at, uh, at Melanchthon and Oculumpadius' comments, um, because this debate really develops almost 100 years after them, and really expands into uh, these different categories, we have to look for comments uh, that indicate where they fit in, these, in this category here. Um, so Richard Muller has suggested this taxonomy that I've, that I've given to you. Uh, and I'm not going to go through each of those seven there. Um, and it's primarily derived from and intended for understanding theologians in the, in the late 16th to 17th century. Because that's when this debate was hot. That's when everyone was talking about this and trying to uh, give their own explanations for it. Um, but I think it is helpful and we can use it in discerning what a certain exegete prior to these debates was saying, what their views, what their conclusion would have been on this topic. All right, so I, I'm going to talk about number one, and I'm going to point to number three, and, uh, and then uh, I'll note uh, five and six as well, um, because they help us understand uh, where Aquilampadius in particular falls on this. Um, so the first one there is that ambiguous. Um, this, Muller observes and others observe, this is the most common language. In fact, you find this in your textbook when you take Doctrine 2 here. Sufficient for all, efficient for some. That's not exclusively Reformed. That's not exclusively Protestant. That's not exclusively anything. It's ambiguous. In fact, no matter where someone fell, a lot of times they would use this same formula. Um, it, the medieval scholastic uh, Peter Lombard in his sentences, his, his book The Sentences, 
uh, uses this phrase, and he's the one who made it popular. Sufficient for all, efficient for the elect. But the ambiguous nature is readily apparent uh, because people on either side of this issue, on any part of this spectrum, would agree with that statement. Uh, and so we have to get, dig a little bit more. Uh, so it's essential to recognize what the specific question is that we are seeking to answer. So there I've got our uh, taxonomy of these seven uh, statements here, are seven different kinds of limited atonement. So this doesn't really address the unlimited, although they could fit under number one. Um, our specific question is not, did God intend for Christ's death to save the elect alone? Again, no matter what one's view, they would pretty much all agree God intended for Christ's death to save the elect alone. They would maybe debate over how one was elected, but they would agree with that. Nor is it that did God intend the application of Christ's death only for the elect or for those who believe, depending on how they would phrase it. Right? How it is applied is, again, only for those who are actually saved. So it's neither of those questions. Rather, this is how Muller helps us frame this, as well as one of his uh, doctoral students now. For whose sins did God intend Christ, so it's this intention language, to make an objectively sufficient satisfaction for sins. All right, this is the question, and this is where I know I realize it gets a little technical here. What's, what are all the differences here? But it's the intention before creation. What is God intending, and then how is that limited, or how is that defined? And it did these did his did he intend that they would objectively pay for the sins of everybody or only the sins of those who are elect or those who will believe. All right? And then we can narrow down uh, what it is that each of these uh, exegetes say, these interpreters say. All right? So the, the exegetical comments and the relevant scripture passages that I looked at uh, come from, uh, I have those listed on your hand up there, uh, particularly the commentaries on John, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Hebrews, and 1st John. Um, and I've given you the, the title pages here. The one on the left is Melanchthon's uh, title page to his Romans and Corinthians commentary. And then the one on the right here is uh, actually uh, Aquilampadius's on 1st John. Um, just to give you a sample of what these kind of look like. Uh, so all these writings are in Latin, um, and I had to translate through them in Latin as I was uh, discerning what's their views. Um, so. For Melanchthon, I'm going to spend a little less time on him because there's pretty much universal agreement among scholars um, who I've named several of them here and footnoted. And if you're interested in seeing their names and who they are, you can read the whole article here, uh, look at the whole paper here. Um, but near the end of his life, in 1559, Melanchthon specifically included a refutation of the doctrine of limited atonement. Um, scholars are in full agreement that Melanchthon taught universal atonement. In contrast to the work done on Melanchthon and the consistency of uh, what his view was, numerous resources point to the fact that there's a glaring omission here when considering Aquilampadius' view, especially in English research. Um, more specifically, Aquilampadius' view has been ignored on, the, on this topic, has been ignored, and in a few places, there's substantial disagreement. Um, so indicative of this scholarship, there's one dissertation that mentions him uh, as part of the fellow reformers who interacted with Calvin and Beza. Aquilampadius gets four sentences, and here's what it says there. Information on the Basel reformer Aquilampadius is somewhat scant. It's kind of an understatement there. A clear statement of the doctrine of particular redemption is found, however, in his commentaries on Hebrews and Daniel. Aquilampadius explains that Christ suffered, quote, for many and not for all, since many are called, but few are chosen. Aquilampadius apparently based his doctrine of particular redemption on a limited election rather than on a limited faith. And similarly, another scholar, Robert Latham, contends that Aquilampadius has a clear pre-Basin, pre-Theodore Basin, doctrine of limited atonement. And he bases his on this same passage, many are called, but few are chosen. Which actually, as I noted, that's not the best way to frame the question. Um, that's not a clear uh, instance of limited atonement. That could be the application of what Christ's death was, not the intention. All right? On the opposite end of the spectrum, Kurt Daniel contends that Aquilampadius seems to have been of the same persuasion of universal atonement. And others also note 
uh, Oculum Pontius' statement that Christ, with his innocent blood, took away the sin of the world to argue that he held to universal atonement. So there's a lack of clarity, a lack of consistency on Oculum Pontius' view on limited atonement in these relevant passages. Um, and so, uh, again, I think it's helpful, I found it helpful to look at Melanchthon's views and how he can be consistently categorized as unlimited atonement in order to help us understand Oculum Pontius' views. Um, and so throughout his comments, throughout his commentaries, um, Melanchthon, so this is a reminder that uh, Christ's death paid for the sins does not necessarily point universal, and for the sins of the elect, not necessarily limited. Um, Melanchthon, uh, throughout his commentaries, uses this kind of language. Christ's death was for our sins. Christ paid the penalty for our sins. Christ took our sins as if they were his own. The death of Christ is the satisfaction and the sacrifice for our sins. But the challenge is, who is our? Who is us? Uh, he doesn't, in some cases, he doesn't specifically identify. Uh, is it all humanity, or is it we who believe? So, for example, in his comments on Romans 8, he affirmed that while sin still remains in those who believe, faith makes it so that sin is not imputed, because the fulfilling and satisfaction of Christ is our satisfaction, which Christ made for us. In this case, the us is those who believe. Yet in his comments on John 6, Melanchthon affirmed that because Christ in his flesh satisfies the law and died for us, we believe he is our satisfaction, and he gives his life for the world. Where our seems to imply the world, and he's equating it with the world. Now, we actually see that in many of his comments, he would side more with those who are later of limited atonement or definite atonement. Um, so like for example, in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, Melanchthon affirmed that the world here means not only Jews, but also Gentiles. He could have, and later, opponent, later proponents of unlimited atonement, he could have said, this is proof that Christ died for every individual person. But he didn't do that. Um, likewise, in John 10, where he says, I lay down my life for the sheep, where Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep, Melanchthon equated the sheep with those who believed and said, quote, by his death, Christ redeemed the life for the sheep, and by death he testified that he is concerned for his sheep. However, it must be noted that Melanchthon doesn't state that Christ's death was intended only for the sheep. This again can be application. In fact, he also affirms in the same passage that the gospel has to be preached all the way to the end of the world, to everybody. Now, it's important to note here uh, that Melanchthon's view of, of universal atonement is not the same as what later Arminians do. He is not basing it on foreseen faith or free choice. He rejected both of those. He is very much predestination election. Rather, I think what's most what's happening here is that he's making a distinction between justification and satisfaction. So that he's creating this emphasis on justification by faith alone, which makes sense for someone so close with Luther, because that's Luther's great emphasis. Uh, and we could say that the reason it's hard to identify is that us, the whole world, or is us those who believe, is because his answer is yes. It's both. Christ died for the whole world in one sense, but Christ died for those who believe in the other because those who are the ones who will be justified. And so really he's talking about there's an unlimited atonement, that then a subset of that category is those who are justified and actually benefit from that atonement of Christ. And so he insisted that justification is only for those who believe, yet he also maintained that the death of Christ was intended to make satisfaction for all people, so that in order for the gospel to go and be proclaimed to all, some would be able to respond in faith and be justified and benefit from that death for all. All right, so that's that's Melanchthon's view, um, and so we can we can summarize it here is he believed that Christ's death was intended for all, but the application was just for those who believe. And as uh, my Lutheran colleagues at um, at the 16th century conference stated, yeah, I don't know why you reform people are still debating all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can move to Oculus Pontius. 
Um, Aqua Pines is a little more complicated, but I think seeing what we've seen with Melanchthon's view, uh, especially this language of who is the us, who is the our, is helpful in discerning what Oculimpadius view. All right, so there's many examples that we could point to where Oculimpadius uses universal language. Again, on John 1.29, the whole Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Oculimpadius, more strongly than Melanchthon, who is universal, is taught on account of Christ, the sins of the whole world were abolished. And he also emphasized here, the text does not say, quote, Christ removed his own sins, or those of another one, but of the whole world. In his explanation of 1 John 2 also, he declared that Christ, quote, gave himself as the redemption, the price of redemption for all. Romans 8, he repeated that Christ carried away the sins of the world. Uh, in his comments in the, in the Basel Catechism on the Apostle Creed, uh, the question about why did he suffer the children are expected to answer this way. He suffered not for his own fault, as the one who committed no sin, nor was there found deceit in his mouth, but for ours and of the whole world. Oculimpadius also frequently used this number one, this sufficient, efficient language, expressing that the sufficiency of Christ's atonement was for expiating, another fancy term there, taking away the sins of the whole world. And in his John commentary, he stated that whatever blemish or filth is in this world, the worth of him and his blood is able to cleanse it. Whatever pertains to this worth is sufficient to purify the whole world for sin. Yet this is still in that ambiguous language, sufficiency. But what about efficiency? What about intention? Um, and so we can see the ambiguous nature of this. Hebrews 7, uh, his comments there, he affirmed that Christ's death is, quote, the most sufficient and the most efficacious this one up here, for all who will be saved. So while he clearly indicates that the efficacy is for those who believe, it could also perhaps be concluded that he thought the sufficiency was only for those who believe. And that would put him uh, in number six or number seven there on your taxonomy. But like Melanchthon, Aquilampadius argued at length for election, for predestination. In fact, he said uh, at one point in his Hebrews commentary, to speak about predestination any differently is not right, if indeed one is going to speak from the Spirit according to Scripture. But predestination, the election, the doctrine of election, does not necessitate a limited atonement view, or definite atonement view. In his Hebrews commentary, Aquilampadius explained here that, quote, Christ paid the price of his blood on behalf of we who are redeemed. Moreover, he redeemed the elect, in such a way that he bore not only the guilt, but also the entire penalty. This is limiting language. Sim similarly, Romans 8, uh, those who he predestined, he called by the preaching of the gospel, and he justified by the death of his son. On 1 John, Aquilampadius goes so far as to say, Christ's death is the sacrifice of sins for the whole world, that is, the whole church. Where he's equating the world and the church, or those who believe, uh, those who come to him in good faith, is how he phrases it. And that definitely sounds like definite atonement. Uh, he further argued, for while the blood of Christ is sufficient for placating the Father, even if there have been 10,000 sins in countless ways and more than 10,000 worlds, no one could be saved by Christ's death who does not give up their sins or place salvation in Christ. In that way, the death of Christ is not effective for those who don't believe. Um, many places, Aquilampadius does the same thing with, like Melanchthon, of saying Christ died for our sins. Um, in some places, it's clear that this refers to all humanity. In other places, it's also clear that he's limiting this to we who believe. So again, on John 1.29, he identified that, quote, we who believe are cleansed by the blood of Christ, and however many are saved from their sins, they are purified by that blood only those who believe. And we see this idea in many other comments uh, of his commentaries. I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more of them listed here, translated and footnoted for you to go look in his commentaries. Um, and so even in Romans 5, uh, he, he offers a qualification by all understand those who believe. For it's clear that the unbelieving are not justified. Now the question is, is he doing the same thing that Melanchthon was doing? 
Uh, is he simply having this category of unlimited that now has a subset of those who believe get to benefit from the application of Christ's death? Um, or did Ockel and Pius believe that Christ's death was intended to satisfy for the sins of the elect only, which would put him in one of these definite categories, five, six, or seven there, or, as Muller frames the question here, was Christ's death, Christ's satisfaction, in some sense intended to objectively pay for all sins such that if all believe, all would be saved? This is the hypothetical part, okay? The if, then. That's what makes it hypothetical. So it's universal, but only hypothetically so. As we've seen, Aquilampadius uses both universal and particular limiting language. Aquilampadius also used hypothetical language in his exegetical comments. There's many examples where he made a statement like this one, quote, he is our satisfaction and our most sufficient price if only we believe in him. That still could be application though and not intention. In the passage that these other scholars quote to say that he is uh, definitely definite atonement, Aquilampadius actually speci specifically articulates there, indeed he could have removed all sin, but many render themselves unworthy and ungrateful to Christ. They reject his offering of salvation with disbelief. It could have been for everybody, but it's not because they didn't believe. On John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he declared that God excludes no one, and if we perish, it's plainly our own fault. The death of Christ itself and his exaltation on the cross is the most sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world to be removed. That's universal. For this reason, the one who will refuse to believe, there's the limiting factor, is already condemned. If they would have believed, it would have been for them. He expressly he expressed here the universal extent of atonement and the limiting ground of refusal to believe, which is on the taxonomy that Muller has created there, one of the indications of hypothetical universalism. It's certainly worth noting that in the 17th century, a proponent of hypothetical universalism, Herman Hildebrand, cited and quoted some of these comments by John Aquilampadius on his, from his commentary on John as evidence that Aquilampadius taught hypothetical universalism. Even more clearly, we see this language in his comments on Romans 8. For the passion indeed was effective enough and accomplished the cup of immortality so the passion is the suffering, the death of Christ, was effective enough and accomplished it that it would benefit all if all would drink from it. But since not all drink, not all benefit. Here, Aquilampadius uses the language of efficacy and accomplishment with regard to Christ's death and specifies that everyone would have benefited if everyone had believed. Finally, in one place that I found from all these commentaries, do we find anything about the order? So uh, in number uh, three there on your taxonomy, um, it describes an order of how God planned this. So in, in uh, his comments on John 6, Aquilampadius says, if I can get it up there, this is the method for our salvation. First, predestination precedes, then by the cross and the merit of our Christ, salvation is established. Then also, it is required from us that we believe and have trust in the Son and give glory to the Son. Now for somebody, decades before these debates are taking place, this is as close as anyone could expect from someone commenting specifically on these passages of scriptures to express this version of typical hypothetical universalism which maintain that God made a prior absolute decree to save the elect, predestination, then subsequently will to save all, if and us all who would believe, and if they believed, if everyone had believed, everyone would be saved. So, so what? Why does this matter? Um, well, for me, doing Aquilampadius studies, now I can say more about what Aquilampadius believed. For the rest of us, uh, in the Reformed tradition, it has often been emphasized that L, in order to be a real Reformed, real Calvinist, you've got to be a five-point Calvinist. In limited atonement, you have to believe limited atonement. This expands that one of the most significant and the earliest proponents of Reformed theology really fits in this category of typical hypothetical universalism. 
Uh, Auckland bodies expressed that Christ's death was intended to be sufficient for all. It was effective for those who believe. And it would have been effective for all if all had believed. Um, and so he insisted, uh, given, given Auckland Pontius' influence on the Reformed tradition, it seems likely that those who later articulated this view more strongly built on a foundation laid in part by Auckland Pontius. Um, and is one of...